My name is Julia Boulanoir. I'm a WASH consultant and the co-director of AgroConsult, a UK-based consulting company. I'm also co-leading the thematic group on sustainable service delivery uh, as part of the Rural Water Supply Network. And I'm part of the US-funded Rural Evidence and Learning for Water program, which we also call Real Water, where I coordinate the research on a very related topic, which we've called improving management performance for rural water services. Next slide, please. So as Ricard presented, delivering rural water services at scale and at last is very complex. And like for any other public service, it's really not just about the infrastructure. And in fact, one could argue that the engineering aspect of rural water service delivery hasn't changed much over time and is overall quite well mastered. And there's also consensus in the sector that what makes rural water service delivery complex is not the engineering part. For services to last and reach everyone, Many elements of the enabling environment are required to be in place and work effectively. And this is what Ricard was saying. These elements relate to the institutions, to financing, but also to ways of working. It's about having the right coordination in place, working in an inclusive manner. Another aspect that makes rural water services complex is that water is a public good. And this comes with a lot of cultural baggage and adds complexity. Water service delivery involves balancing competing pressures. For example, when it comes to financing, we need to balance financial viability with affordability. We need to balance um, service expansion with service maintenance. It requires dealing with institutional fragmentation, which in a lot of countries is a defining feature of the sector. And finally, it involves considering context variability. What works in one part of the world or in one part of a country won't work in another. Rural populations are diverse and will continue to be, and approaches to serve them should account for this variability. So all of this to say that providing rural water services that last and for everyone is not so straightforward and ultimately extremely political. Next slide, please, Sean. So the recognition of this complexity has actually taken quite a lot of time and it's also been mirrored in the way management has been approached. And from that perspective, we can identify four major blocks of time over the past decades. Before the 1980s, the provision of rural water services was largely centralized and was characterized by a focus on hardware and top-down approaches. A second block of time is, goes from the 1980s to the years 2000, where community-based management was introduced and then rolled out to become the predominant model. And for the first part of this period, this coincided with the UN drinking water and sanitation decade. And this choice was fueled by a number of factors and I can mention a few. One was the recognition that centralized approaches had not really achieved the expected results and that transpired in the low uh, functionality rates and the difficulty of maintaining infrastructure over time. Another reason was that in many parts of the world, governments were reducing their spendings and abdicating to some of their core responsibilities and shifting them downwards to communities. And thirdly, there was a growing recognition for the need to increase community participation in order to increase ownership. The third major block of time was from the years 2000, where the limits of community management were starting to be evidenced. And they were starting to accumulate in different ways, talking about low functionality rates, but also poor quality of service. 
And a number of voices were raising the need to provide more systematic support over a long period of time and well beyond a project duration. And this was particularly uh, important in the context of growing decentralization and limited resources allocated to local government to fulfill their mandate. And finally, a last block of time that we see starting uh, in the last 10 years, where alternatives to basic community management have emerged and are increasingly expanding. And that can be explained by a number of factors again, but the main one is about the growing expectation from rural populations and national governments that are just hiring standards and aspirations in line with this, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. We see different types of efforts being deployed across countries in that regard, and they relate to firstly strengthening CBN, so keeping community-based management as the main model, but strengthening it deliberately. And this takes different forms again, but particularly efforts to strengthen um, building blocks such as regulation. And we see that, for example, in Peru, where efforts have been um, targeted towards delivering water quality standards and making a deliberate effort to regulating rural water quality. A second type of effort has to do with the adoption of alternative model specifically, so public utility, private sector provision, and we see that in many countries. I'm just going to cite a few. Rwanda, Senegal, Ghana, Mali, or Zambia are moving in that direction. And finally, we see efforts to consolidate services, which we call clustering or aggregation. And this goes hand in hand with the adoption of alternative models. And we're seeing that again in many places with the objective of increasing service quality, but also increasing financial viability. Next slide. So in any case, we know that rural populations are not monolithic. They vary in size, density, but also type of service they receive. And for that reason, multiple approaches to service provision are needed and will always be needed in the future. So various typologies of service delivery models exist. Um, and they differ in the number of variants that they identify, but they all recognize four broad types of models. The first one is self-supply, where households construct and maintain their service. And that's a dominant model in highly dispersed areas, but also where services are largely um, uh, limited. The second management model is community-based management, which has been the dominant model over um, quite a period of time. And in that model, communities take on the burden of maintenance themselves with limited or no external support. And now there's growing recognition for the need um, to provide external support over time. And so we're, we tend to term this uh, model supported community-based management. And that support can be provided through different channels. Um, it could uh, take the form of outsourcing core functions to the private sector, aggregating communities in association or outsourcing functions to uh, government. The third model is private sector participation. And in that, under that model, private operators can either own assets and manage them or have been delegated the responsibility of operation and maintenance by a public body. And the fourth type is public service provision where governments provide water services directly, and this could be done either through local government or through a public utility. Next slide, please. So just a couple of uh, takeaway messages here. I think in this presentation, we've seen that rural water services are delivered in different ways in different contexts. And this is likely to remain that way in the coming future to account for diversity of populations, services and contexts. We've seen that broadly over time, there's been an evolution from the predominant community-based management to a diversification of models. 
largely to address some weaknesses of community-based managements and to account for higher expectations of rural populations. There's different ways of typologizing these models, but all typologies point to four broad categories, self-supply, community-based, public provision, and service provision. And I would say the most important point is that regardless of the service provider, a service delivery model is not just about the type of provider, but about the sorry, the uh, enabling environment within which the operator um, works. And so ensuring that all the building blocks are in place and sufficiently strong is a core requirement, regardless of the type of service provider. And I will stop here.